Roger Bame has been totally blind for 30 years, but before that, as a young teenager, he enjoyed playing cards. I think that was an eight. It's fantastic. Roger is testing a device based on a concept which many have found hard to believe, that it's possible to see using the tongue. Vision through the tongue, hearing through the eyes, using one sense to substitute for another. These concepts were the brainchildren of the late Mexican-born neuroscientist Paul Bakirita. Many considered Bakirita's brain theories heresy, yet over the course of 30 years, he and his followers managed to build devices based on his ideas. In this 1976 documentary, Bakirita explained his theory. The brain is able to use information coming from the skin as if it were coming from the eyes. Baki Rita was bucking the long-held assumption that after early childhood the brain was fixed, that it couldn't change. He argued that the brain was actually plastic, that it could undergo major reorganization throughout our lives. In this 2003 film, he explained. We don't see with the, with the eyes, for example. We don't hear with the ears. All of that goes on in the brain. Remember, if, you're, if, if I'm looking at you, the image of you doesn't get beyond my retina, just the back of my eye. From there to the brain, to the rest of the brain, it's pulses, pulses along nerves. Well, those pulses aren't any different than the pulses from the big toe. It's the way the information they carry is in the frequency and the pattern of pulses. And so if you can train the brain to extract that kind of information, then you don't need the eye to see. You can have an artificial eye. If all the brain's sensory stimuli are pulses, and pulses from all the senses are similar, the brain might be retrained to substitute one sense for another. Pulses that normally travel to their particular area in the brain might be rerouted to a different sense's cortex. This plasticity allows the brain to relearn the senses. Baki Rita experimented using the sense of touch. The sense of touch has been really neglected, certainly in technological development. Though almost everything that's ever been developed to connect something to the brain is via the eyes and the ears. His first device substituted the sense of sight for the sense of touch on the subject's back. Made from an old dentist chair, a camera became the eyes, and the light pulses were then routed to blunted needles that delivered the pattern of the object onto the back. It's a telephone, and the receiver is to the right. It's like when you were kids and your brother or sister would draw something on your back, and you'd be, you know, guessing what they're drawing. It's the same kind of thing. This is electronically drawing it on my tongue. When I trace it with my tongue, I first determine at the top to see if it's rounded or it's pointed. And when I see that point at the top or more pointed in the tail, then I go, no, it's a spade. And if it's all rounded, then I know it's a club. At the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Mitch Tyler, Yuri Danilov, and Kurt Kazmarek were Baki Rita's chief collaborators at the Tactile Display Lab. Their most sophisticated device yet is now being tested at a company called WeCab, set up in 2001 by Baki Rita and Tyler. As they still don't have a custom-made camera, this off-the-shelf device currently uses three cameras to function as one. This one gives us our widest field of view, this one gives a medium field of view, and this one's really good for close-up shots. But when he uses the zoom lever, he moves through them as if it's one camera. In a black and white image, any, Im any pixels in the image that are white show up as a strong stimulation on the tongue. Any pixels that are gray show up as a medium level stimulation on your tongue. And any pixels that are black are no stimulation. And so that's how we translate the black and white camera image to vibrations on the tongue. Is that, is that a black liner? Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's why. The earliest chair device used mechanical solenoids to stimulate sensations on the back. But today, a computer converts the camera information into electrical pulses and delivers them to the tongue, which is far more sensitive than the back. From the tongue, they begin their trip to the brain. The current device, known as a brain port, has 625 sensors to deliver fine-grained information to the tongue and then the brain. Early devices had only 144 sensors and delivered a much less precise sensation. I don't even think of it now anymore, of, of uh, sensation of touch, as automatically as, oh, just like you would look with your eyes across the room and see the thing hanging on the wall. <laughs> what we're going to do 
kind of trying to stay in the middle of these two lines. Baki Rita's concept that the sense of touch could affect the visual cortex was verified in 2005 by neuropsychologist Maurice Tito. Both blind and sighted people's brains were scanned with a PET scan device. Then using their tongues, they were asked to determine which way the letter T was oriented. The sighted people were blindfolded. Later, PET scans showed no difference in the sighted subjects' brains. But for the blind, after the sensory substitution experiment, their visual cortices showed distinct stimulation. Something was getting through to the blind subjects' visual centers. But had the touch sensation really become vision? Now you have a visual behavior, you have an active visual cortex. So what is it if it's not vision? The question is a philosophical question. If you give the same kind of information, not through the eye, but to the tongue, is it still vision? My personal thing is it's visual information. And so when Roger can find a cup on the table and grab right for it, that's vision. The last year when I was up here the first time, we were doing stuff on the table in the kitchen. And, uh, you know, I got kind of a little emotional because it was 33 years since I've seen before and I could reach out and I see the different size balls. I mean, I visually see them. I could reach out and grab them, not grope or feel for them, pick them up and see the cup and I could raise my hand, drop it right in the cup. And vision isn't the only sense which can be reorganized with the brain port equipment. Mitch Tyler had an illness which put a second device on the fast track. Well, I had an inner ear infection. I woke up one morning and sat upright and fell over on the sofa um, and the world was spinning. I thought to myself, this really stinks. If I could just have something that told me where up is and where I am in space, it would be great. So I wandered in here and proposed this idea to Paul that what if we could present balance information. Cheryl Schiltz also lost her sense of balance. An antibiotic had destroyed the filaments in her inner ears, which transformed sound into nerve pulses. This wrecked her vestibular system, which controls balance. I said, you mean there's nothing that can be done? What do you mean permanent? There's got to be like medicine or a surgery or something. I can't live like this for the rest of my life. Are you crazy? Cheryl's life was so impaired that the thought that she would ever again work a regular job, much less ride a bike, seemed impossible. Tyler and Kazmarek built the balance device just like the vision device, but with one difference. Instead of a camera for sight, they used an accelerometer, a full motion tilt sensor in a helmet to transmit head and body position to the tongue. I was sitting in my backyard and I received a call from Dr. Baccarita. And he told me about the study that they were doing with sensory substitution. I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to put this thing on my tongue and it's going to make me feel imbalanced. Oh, sure. And I put the, uh, put the device on my tongue and asked to navigate a uh, kind of like a video game thing on a computer. Now the, the square in the middle represents the position of the head. It's in the neutral position. And then if we tip it forward, the sensation moves to the tip of the tongue. So I will feel a signal moving forward or back or side to side. And what that is is telling me, OK, I'm, I'm too far forward, I have to come back and put that signal back into, my, into the middle of my tongue. And that's where I know that that's where I am in balance and I'm indeed standing straight up. We saw that Cheryl can use it immediately and very effectively. And as a matter of fact, so effectively, so the next logical question was, let's remove it and see how long she can stay without it. Her feeling of stability, what they called the retention or residual effect, lasted in direct proportion to how long she used the device. God, it's so wonderful. <laughs> From there on, we started just built on that and to eventually getting to doing a 20-minute trial. And that's where we recognized that there's a residual. And it was like for an hour, I was normal. And it was just phenomenal. We realized you don't have to wear it all the time. This could be something you use twice or three times a day for 20 minutes. And what happened was the residual grew stronger and stronger and longer and longer to the point where I really didn't even need, I could skip days. And now it's like I don't, I very, very, really, very rarely use it. It rewired my brain. There's no doubt about it. Cheryl's balance system wasn't repaired. Her brain had actually developed a new one. Paul Bakirita died in 2006, but the tactile display lab continues the work. 
Meanwhile, at a private company, WeCab, commercial versions of the balance and vision devices are undergoing trials. So Paul has now passed the baton on to us, if you will, you know, to the next generation, that we're the ones that get it. The devices that we've developed are all physical manifestations of Paul's vision 40, 50 years ago, based on this crazy concept, you know, that you could somehow rewire or reroute information and by rerouting that information, rewire the brain. For Wired Science, I'm Kamala Lopez.